Thank you for your service. And as today as we come, like I said, there's a few things that we want to share. You know, I've got a lot of announcements. I want to get through this. But one thing that's come up is last week we had the trunk or treat, and there was a contest for the best vehicle. I don't know if you knew that. But Stan and Belinda, you won that. So come on up here. Thank you, and there's a little gift card for you, just for both of you. Thank you very much for that. Another quick one is, uh, each and every week we have an Awana here, but the uh, store is running low. There goes the mask. The store is running low, so what I'd like to see, you know, if you can help in that, bring gifts, and we're going to be collecting gifts for the Awana store. So if you can help in that area, bring those gifts and bring them in. One other quick thing is the operation, the shoe box, is coming very soon. And what we'd like to do is show a video again, and we're going to need those boxes back that by next week. So let's go with the video now. Also a great way to teach your own kids about giving. Teach your kids about giving. giving. Have a great day. Oh, and don't forget, make good choices. So basically you get an empty box, which any box will work. Really? Okay, not any box. Much better. Okay, so now you have your empty box. Now you can pick the age range, and if you want it before a boy or a girl. Okay, come on, please be a boy. Please be a boy? Well, we'll start we're going to be packing for a boy this year. First, you can choose a wow item, such as a soccer ball or a stuffed animal. Mm. And you can choose other fun toys, too. Hygiene items oh, and school supplies. There are, of course, some items you cannot pack, like liquids. Food, items related to war, live animals, and don't even think about packing chocolate because it melts. When your gift is finished, you can write a letter and include a photo. It gives it a nice personal touch. When your box is done, you can make your $7 shipping donation online through Follow Your Box. Simply print off your tracking label to see where the destination of your gift will be. And don't forget, it's important to pray for the child that is receiving this gift. Because packing a box is a simple way to share the gospel with kids all around the world. Maybe even in... Mib... In Africa. Now that your box is done, it's time to get moving. Transport your box to a nearby drop-off location near you. These will be open all across the U.S. on National Collection Week, the third week in November. Drop it off and voila, you pack the shoebox. Easy as one, two, three. We saw last week how those boxes affect people's lives, and we, we had a testimony last week of how it touched somebody from Kyrgyzstan, and they, you know, and that, that was a great joy for us to be able to see God's work. So just bring your boxes by next week, and we'll drop them off, and then we'll get those transported out. But one other quick thing I want to say is, Sarah, Brianna, raise your hand. Everybody see them right in the middle. On November 21st, they're going to be moving. They're going to need some help. So if you can help in that... Get a hold of them after the service and let them know. And they're gonna, we're gonna put their address in next week's bulletin. That way you know it and what time. And they need our help. So if you can join in that, we need some strong arms. So I know there's a lot of you out there that can do that. So please join in that. 
One thing too is there is a senior, in your bulletin you're going to see there's a senior uh, a Bible study starting this Tuesday. So look in your bulletin. Join that if you're a senior. Some of you are out there, or a senior. I'm getting there, but not, oh yeah I am. I'm there, my grandkids tell me all the time, but thank you. Let's, let's go to the Father now in prayer as we pray for this offering. Father God, what a beautiful day when your people can come together to praise your holy name. And Father God, as we take this offering, Father, we praise you that you have blessed each of us so richly. And as we give back to you, God, let us give with a cheerful heart. Use this to further your kingdom. We praise your holy name. Amen. Great. Hey, um, I would like to uh, let you know that Several people will be joining church this, uh, join membership today. So if Stan and Belinda Lau could come forward, and then also Tristan and Darcy Cavanaugh, Jody Mosser, and Irene Davies to come join me in the front. Yeah. Oh, great. Joining, joining membership of the church and sunshiny day just go together for me. I just yeah. something about it. You know, it's just great. So uh, a couple of weeks ago we had a step in class, which is uh, membership class. Step in is belonging to the church. Step on is how to grow in your faith. Step up is how to serve, and step out is how to share your faith. And so uh, these took the step in class, and so they're ready for membership. I just want to introduce them, Tristan and Darcy. I think it was like the week after you guys arrived here, you jumped into Wawana, started leading games, TNT, and it was just like, wow, that's awesome. And then also, uh, today, Tristan is running the slides for our PowerPoint, so and I just appreciate that. Uh, Stan and Belinda Lau, they are uh, involved in like leading youth in terms of the Bible studies, in terms of events. They were in charge of Hunger Busters last week at the Halloween, and we're just so glad they're here. Belinda also is our office volunteer. And uh, she does a great job doing that, along with Barb here. They're, they're the office team, and we're so grateful for them. And one thing that some of you are probably pretty excited about is we're actually going to get a pictorial directory. It's been like, I don't know how long since we've had one, so just we're super excited about that. And then also Belinda serves on the worship team. Jody Mosser, she is part of our new newly formed uh, women's ministry team and uh, planning events and stuff like that for uh, w our women's ministry. And then also Irene is helping in a lot of different areas. But the one thing that we know that she's doing is the Awana. She's, she, you, can, you can see underneath this, her incredible smile. This is like, like a little piece of sunshine right here. So it's just great. We just appreciate all of you and how you jumped in. And that's really what membership is mostly about. It's about a commitment to jump in and help Real Hope accomplish its mission of bringing real hope to our community. So I got a couple of questions for you. The one number one is, and if you if you if you uh, well, yeah, I guess I'll give you the cue words later. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only salvation, uh, only source of salvation? If so, just say I do. Yes. All right, great. And are you here and joining this church uh, because you agree with its doctrine? and are wanting to support its vision and mission? If so, say, I am. I am. All right, Lord. Lord, thank you so much for these people, uh, the Lows and the Kavanaugh's and Irene and, and Jody who've come to say, I'm here to, uh, to be part of the mission and fulfill, fill, fulfilling the mission to bring real hope to our community. And that's just so awesome. So we pray your blessing on them. We pray for fruitful ministry and that the, that the ministries of the church minister to them and that they minister in the ministries as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Give him a... All right. All right. All right. Sid, will you come forward? <laughs> a few weeks ago, Sid was telling me, hey, I'm going to go back to the Philippines. And uh, he, he got, in a, got in an airplane and got as far as Korea. And then he was turned back. And so we've been praying that the Lord would open doors. And just, I don't know what, two, three weeks ago, 
Uh, and we've been praying, you know, off and on. And, and Sid said, uh, you know, I, I, I checked about the schedule and they won't see me till, well, they're, they're scheduled at the immigration office in California, which is where he had to go, uh, is, is booked up until next March. And we said, let's pray. He called the next day, I think it was, and they said, you have an appointment in a week. <laughs> so God just opened doors for him. I mean, that's, that's crazy. That's really crazy. Awesome answer to prayer. And now finally, you're going to get on a plane and what? Wednesday night, going to the Philippines. Let's pray for him. Because we want to pray him there, but we also want to pray him back. <laughs> And Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Sid. Thank you for the work that he's done to build this wall that's behind us. And uh, that's a beautiful wall, Lord, just to bring, to add so much to a sanctuary. But I also thank you for the first thing that I learned about Sid, and that is not only his willingness to serve, but his willingness to represent you, mm -hmm. to let people know about you. That really is on his heart. And I just pray as he goes on the plane, Lord, that you give him opportunities to speak to people about you, Jesus, and also... Uh, as he's in the Philippines, where he's from, uh, that he that you would just bless him in the things that he needs to accomplish there, and the things also that he desires to accomplish personally and also for you. We pray your anointing, your safety, and your um, just your fulfilling his purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, brother. Amen, amen. Isn't God good? Yeah, God's really good. Oh, 
been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will see of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful goodness of God. I will 
good to give thanks to the Lord and to proclaim His faithfulness day after day because the faithfulness of the Lord never, never ends. The goodness of the Lord never ends. How can we ever how can we ever get to the end of praising the Lord? Because His loving kindness never ends. His goodness never fails. His compassion never fails. And Lord, so for that reason, our praise of you just keeps going on because there's always something new that you're doing. There's always something, some way that you're chasing after us to do us good. You love, Lord, to bless us. You love to do good to us. You love your compassion is faithful to us. Your forgiveness pursues us in those places that we find ourselves like, oh, how did I get here? Why am I here? The Lord did not lead me here, but I was led here. But Lord, come and find me. His goodness. I want, I want every one of you to sing this in those times where you find yourself needing the forgiveness. I think this is a good song to sing. Let's sing that bridge. Your goodness is running left. It's running left to me. Yes, Lord. Your goodness is running left. It's running left to me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. It's running left to me. Thank you, God, for your goodness, your faithfulness. Lord, I ask you that your Holy Spirit would come now and open up our hearts as we hear the Word of God. Anoint, Lord, your Word so that it enters our heart and stays there and rings and keeps on ringing and reminding us of your goodness, your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today is the Sunday after the election. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the election is over. The counting is not over. But we have cast our ballots. We have cast our ballots. Let's turn to Romans 13. In your pew Bible in front of you, if you didn't bring your Bible, page 1,617, I think. Something like that. Every four years, we vote for a president. We vote for people who we want to put in government. We have that wonderful privilege. And I encourage everyone here to, void, to vote, to let their voice be heard, to make a decision about uh, who they have an option. We have options in this country, who we're going to vote on. But a new president is going to be inaugurated this January, whether that's Biden or whether that is Trump. And either is a possibility at this point. That's not my point, though. But what I want you to think about is in the moments that I have begun this message, I want you to think about how you feel about each of those. When I started to say that we're going to have a presidential uh, inauguration in January, how do you feel about it? Don't, don't, don't raise your hands. Don't, you know, just inside, you just... Think about that, that, that you were sort of, I think, affected by me even starting to talk about that. You might have been stressed out. You might have been happy. You might have been relieved. You might have been you know, upset, whatever. But there was, I imagine there was some sort of emotional reaction, some sort of response that you had in with, within yourself. 
But this president that's going to be inaugurated is going to start making decisions on behalf of 328 plus million people in the United States of America, the great United States of America. He also will hold a certain amount of moral and economic and even spiritual influence over the lives of the people all over the world because of his... Uh,
authority that God has put in your life, His plan of authority in your life, people go like, oh, authority, authority. And we see, we see that word as such a nasty word because, quite frankly, it is, it's been abused. Authority has been abused. But what is authority? Authority is that agency that, is, that has the ability and the power to set things in order and, um, and the ability to carry out that order and reinforce that order. I'm really rather glad that, that there is such a thing as authority. Authority is kind of like friction. I'm not saying authority has to have friction in it. I'm saying authority is like friction. I don't know if you've ever watched the, that school bus, uh, what's it called? Magic school bus. They, they, had this, they had this episode that showed the universe without friction. I could not sit here, or pardon me, stand here, if there was no, and, and, and stand in one place and be stable if there was no friction, because my feet would kind of come out from my, you could not sit in your chair if there, were, there was no friction. It's a, it's a force that grips, you know, two objects together so that they become like stabilized. Well, that's what authority is, too. It's a stabilizing force in our universe. Friction and authority are very much like, because it is a, even though it's like sometimes we don't like being under authority, if we, really had a, if we really had no authority, if we really had no friction in our world, it would be a very different place and not necessarily a good place. Friction is, is actually good, and so is authority. It's people that abuse authority, their authority, that give authority a bad name. But authority is that thing that brings order to our world. Because there's a certain, there's a certain order that, that authority brings. And it's good. I remember the day when... Uh, I'm sorry, let me backtrack for a second. But those who are always bucking authority will find themselves working against God's plan to bless them. I remember when I was 17... You know, trying to figure out what it meant to be a man, trying to figure out what it meant to, to be an adult, trying to figure out where I was going to get a job, and all these sort of decisions that sort of get piled on you at 17, 18, 19 years old. And my parents were in the process of trying to let me go. Actually, they were trying to figure out how to keep me back home. You know, it, you know it's just a normal, I love you, Bobby, and I want to really keep you here. And so they haven't got the, had not got that figured out, and I, nor had I uh, gotten... Um, figured out how to be a man and go forward in my responsibilities. And so that sort of perfect storm there led me to believe that I was being tethered and tugged at and, and held down by my parents. And so I was resisting what they were wanting me to do uh, as I was living in their house. And one day when I was 17, I thought, wow, I think what's causing the problem here is I'm not really willing to submit to their authority. And so... I said, I think maybe things would be better if I submitted to their authority, even though I'm kind of an adult, kind of, graduated from high school. Uh, I'm, you know, I could go on and, and uh, you know, get myself an apartment and a job and, and not necessarily in that order. But <laughs> <laughs> And I tried my theory that it, it might go better if I submitted to their authority, and I tried out my theory, and it was right. The Lord confirmed that, and I found that blessing began flowing into my life. Just a sense of peace, and, you know, and, and there was order, and, and there was goodness, so that when I did depart my parents' home, it was a good departure. Life got a lot better for me. But in verse 3, Paul states the purpose of rulers and authorities. For rulers are not a cause for fear. Rulers are not a cause for fear, for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, or praise from the authorities. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. I love it when police cars travel, you know, cruise through our neighborhood. I love to see the state patrol on the highway. I love to see sheriffs um, at the coffee shop, probably for a couple reasons. Number one, I haven't done anything that I have to be afraid of. 
I, I'm, you know, I'm not a criminal. I haven't done anything. I haven't, you know, I'm not evading the law. I don't have a, a warrant out for my... There, nothing like that. So I don't have to be afraid of, of that. And then number two, I know that their purpose and their intent is to do God good. Excuse me. I'm not saying that every police uh, officer is always up to always good. I know that there are some police officers that are kind of not. And, and I'm, I'm willing to, to, to say that we need to take care of them and maybe we need to usher them out of the police force. But I believe in my heart of hearts and it's been my experience over the course of my entire life, I have not met myself, I have not met any police officers that I would say are crooked. So I'm glad to see them. But it's partly because I haven't done anything wrong. And that's what Paul is saying. If, if you don't want to live in fear of the authorities, then obey the laws. Cooperate with the police. Pay your taxes. Do the things that the law has set up to, for you to do. And you won't have to be afraid. I'm not afraid of the IRS. Why? Because I pay my taxes. I pay them diligently because I don't want to mess with those guys. <laughs> Not that they're bad, but I know that they have authority to come down on me in a way that I don't want to get involved in. But I don't have to worry about that because I pay my taxes. So he continues in verse 5 in chapter 13 of Romans. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection. In other words, if you want to enjoy order in your life and not have a fear of policemen or not have a fear of the IRS agent or not have a, a fear of like what your mom or dad are going to say, you, and you don't have to worry about that, it's necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but because also of conscience sake. What does he mean by that? Well, you know when you do something wrong, and you know it's wrong, and you don't get caught. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> that's awful. You know, as a kid, when you did something wrong, and you go like, I don't know when, but I'm going to get caught. You know, I don't know. Or you're thinking you're going to get away from it, or get, a, get, a, get, a, get away with it, and then, uh, and, then, and then your dad asks you, hey, where were you last? Night? Blah, you know, just, he, he asks you the question, or a question that becomes the question, and you go like, Oh, what do I say? What do I? And you go like, how am I going to get out of this? And you're living in that zone where you're living in fear because you know that you could get found out and you're, you're working hard to not get found out. But you, you know, the, your conscience even tells you that there's someone who is watching you. And it's not anybody mean. It's not anybody that's trying to get you and trying to catch you that wants you to be in trouble, wants to prove that you're a bad person. God is not like that. But He does know everything. He does see everything in your life. And He's like this. Oh, oh, Bob, what are you doing there? That's not the way. Don't do that. Don't go there. No, no, don't do that. I got better stuff for you to be involved. I got better things for you to do. And... Uh, He's a God of forgiveness and a God of love and a God of goodness. And so he wants to, to bring us to good. But there are some things that we need to do and some things that we need to not do. And in our heart of hearts, because we're created in the image of God, we know that God is a God who we want to be right with. We want to have a right relationship with God. That's what righteousness means. It's to be in right relation. That's all it is. It's not anything religious. It's just like you and me. If we have a relationship, you know, it's good for us to be in a right relationship. And so we have a righteous relationship. Nothing, it's not a religious thing at all. It's just to be, treat each other right. Treat each other well. Do good things for each other. And that's what God is. He, is, he wants to bring good into our life. But there are certain things that you just don't do if, if you really respect Him, if you really love Him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so, so in our heart of hearts, because we're created in the image of God, we know that we want to be in right relationship with God. And also, have you ever been accused of something? Now, somebody's like, you did this and you did this. And you know that you didn't. Don't you love that? I mean, not the part that you're accused. I don't like, nobody likes to be accused. I'm like, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that when you think about it, you go like, 
That's so cool. I know I didn't do this. I know I'm innocent. And if we have this relationship with God, it's like we can appeal to God and go like, God, I, I, you see what's going on. You see how I behave. You know that I'm innocent in this. And it doesn't really alleviate the fact that we've been accused, but it's awesome to know that God knows that we're innocent and we're living under his authority. That's awesome. So Christmas music, go getting prepped. All right. So down to verse 6. Paul says, this is the reason that you pay tax. For, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing, rendering to all so render to all what is due, either tax or custom or fear or honor. You know, there are, there are people that work for us, the police, the fire department, um, you know, everybody in uh, Ryan. I don't know if you know Ryan, but Ryan works in the government. He does a really important function. He keeps track of the money that we pay in taxes and that have to pay for things and all that kind of stuff. Ryan's a government official. And so I am glad that somebody with great integrity is handling all that money. I appreciate that very much. But he's got to get paid. He's got to get paid. And so that's why we pay taxes, so that Ryan could get paid and do the work. And policemen could get paid. And fire people come to your house and put out the fire in your house. And the, the roads can get built. And the bridges can get built. And we can have a system that's orderly. But Paul calls on, on us to do much more than just the exchanging of money for services. Taxes are, taxes are only a part of what we do. We give money so that that might be spent on taking care of and, and producing um, our, the things that we need and providing services. But let me ask you this. When people hear you talk for the past four years, for the past four years, when people have heard you talk about President Trump, you might have paid your taxes, you might have obeyed the speed limit, but how did you speak about President Trump these past four years? Because being a citizen of the United States, according to Paul, is about much more than just paying your taxes and, and not speeding. It says, give honor to those whom honor is Deserved. How have you, when people heard you talk about President Trump this past four years, how, what did hear people hear in your voice? Did they hear you respecting and honoring him because he is um, a part of the authority that God has placed over you? Or did they hear something very different that is not in keeping with Scripture? And, 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 for those of you who would vote for Trump and hope that Trump gets in, if Joe Biden gets elected, how will you speak? What will people hear in your voice when you speak about President Joe Biden if he gets elected? So we both, we're both sitting here. This is a mixed group. Those of you who voted for Culp and Inslee is, is voted in by a landslide. How will, what will people hear in your voice as you talk about Governor Inslee in the next however many years he's in? Because Paul says, pay tax to whom tax is due and give honor to whom honor is due. And I will tell you myself, I have not been perfect in this, honoring and respecting our governing officials. I, I will admit it. I have not been perfect in this. I have, had, I have said some, some very... Um, you know, just not appropriate thing. Uh, you know, I just, I'll just admit that I, I struggle in this. is not, it's not something I'm preaching to you. I'm also talking to myself. I honestly am. But listen to what Paul writes in First Timothy two one and two. I urge you then, first of all, to make requests and prayers and intercession and give thanks for everyone for kings and all those in authority. Wow! No matter if I like him, no matter if I don't agree, political, it doesn't matter. All those in authority, pray for them. Now, the prayer might sound something like this. Heavenly Father, please bless and protect our president and our governor and the elected officials and their families. Give them strength when they are weary and give them joy and satisfaction uh, as they preside in their offices. Keep them from people who would take justice into their own hands. Ever prayed that 
for anybody in, in office, keep them from somebody who would take justice into their own hand. God, give them not just wisdom, but your wisdom. Or the, your prayer might so, sound something like this. Um, there may be a time that you need to pray this. God, show in your name a particular leader. Show him your mercy, Lord, because he's leading um, our country or our state or our whatever in a, in a direction that is totally against your word. Dr. Billy Graham, until his death, um, uh, counseled every American president since Dwight Eisenhower and those who, though his views were respected, even though he didn't necessarily agree with the president or those who, who were in power at that point. And he and his son met with, his son Franklin met with Obama to talk about Obama's views of abortion and, and gay marriage. In meeting with the President Franklin, Graham expressed that he and his father are conservative Christians who believe the Bible clearly talks to these issues. And he and encouraged him to read the Scriptures and um, learn from them and know what God says about them. But Dr. Graham and his son Franklin are committed However, to pray faithfully for, we're, we're faithfully uh, committed to pray for each president regardless of how they made decisions or the policies they made. Another thing to note is even though there are laws in our country that legalize acts that are contrary to God's word, there are no laws that I'm aware of that would force you or I as Christian citizens of the United States to, um, um, uh, th that would prevent us from being able to share our faith. And that's something that I want you to know. We are not, we're not prohibited from sharing our faith. Let me explain what I mean. You know, we hear about the concept of a school, has, a prayer has been taken out of school. That's not really accurate. It's not really accurate just to say it like that. There are a lot of things that people throw around and they lead you to believe one thing. But let me, let me read something from the legal record. Quote, because of the prohibition of the First Amendment against the enactment of any law, quote, respecting an establishment of religion, which is made applicable to the states by the 14th Amendment, state officials may not co compose an official state prayer and require that it be recited in the public schools of the state, of that state, pardon me, and at the beginning of each school day. In other words, the government cannot intrude in the affairs of schools. They cannot use schools as a place of prayer for to create their own prayer and require that of students. That's a very different thing than prayer being taken out of schools. I want you to know up until the uh, 1977 when I um, graduated from high school in West Seattle. West Seattle, I mean, Seattle is one of the most liberal places in Washington. And yet, I shared Christ freely with fellow students. I bowed my head probably most every day with my sack lunch and prayed. I was able to attend Bible studies at school, on school grounds, before school or after school or during lunch. There was nothing that held us, and no teacher said, hey, what are you doing that? Why do you pray? And I did have some interesting discussions with my science teacher about evolution and creationism. And I was bold. She could not have brought God up, but I can bring God up. And I did. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> you know, I, wasn't, I wouldn't say that I was disruptive to class but, um, at all, but I did not hide my views about God and His creation. But I want every high school, junior high, and elementary student to hear me. You are legally, you legally have permission to pray, to pray to Jesus Christ. You have legally have permission to, to share Christ in your school. There's nothing in our laws that say you can't do that. There may become a time when you are limited from doing that, but it's not now. So, go for it. Share Christ. Don't think you're... Li now, some people would give you that impression. 
But that's cultural. That's not legal. You are legally allowed to do that. Additionally, there, is a law, there was a law passed on August 11, 1984 that clearly states that public schools must allow additional clubs to be organized as long as the group is voluntarily attended, solely student-led and promoted, and does not interfere with the orderly conduct of educational activity. School d- officials do have the right to monitor the meetings, but um, must afford every group the same treatment, access to space, and resources. I remember a ministry I was recently uh, engaged in and 12 to 15 students from that ministry uh, held a Bible study every week. This was according to the laws of the state of Washington. We had perfect access and it was uninterrupted by school officials. They were unharassed by the school officials. Also, look, uh, I was uh, pastor of a church for seven years and we met for five of the last years that I was pastor there in, a, in an elementary school, which is a state-owned government building. And yet we met in a, in a school, at McKenna Elementary School. We were legally uh, given that right. Some people didn't like the fact that we were there, but that was their personal viewpoint. They didn't want to see a church in a school. They, and they tried to say, hey, what are you doing in a school? And like, hey, the law allows it. And, you know, you can go ahead and talk to the, to the people who lease the building from us. But Paul here is saying submit to the authorities. I think because we have a lot more freedom to do what the Lord wants us to do than we think. Okay? It's not that our culture agrees with us, but the laws are in our favor at this point. But there may be time when we or our grandchildren or our children are ordered by a government to do something that would clearly go against God. What do we do in that case when the government starts to tell us And I think we're kind of on the cusp of that right now. We're very much under the cusp of of the government beginning to encroach on almost telling us how to behave as Christians. You can't do that. That is very close. It's it's really close. So what do we do in those cases? In those cases, is there something in the Bible that would help us that we could look at to say what do we do in those cases? Do you remember the time when the Pharaoh of of Egypt commanded the Jewish midwives, when a baby comes out and it's a boy, go to the river and throw it in? Ooh, God would say, no, 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 no. Do you know when the reason that Daniel ended up in the lion's den is because he broke the law that prohibited him to pray to God? The reason that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace is because they refused the king's command to bow down and worship a huge golden idol. The reason that Peter and the apostles were thrown into jail and beaten is because they were breaking the Sanhedrin's authority by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the temple. All these people that I've listed, the midwives, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the apostles, risked their life disobeying the authority of the government, the governing authorities, so that they might obey Christ. It was not just a willy-nilly, like, we don't like that. We don't like that, so we're not going to do that. No, this was for the sake of of the gospel. This wasn't for their convenience. This isn't what something they, they personally desired. This was for Christ, for God, to serve God, to worship only God. And, though, and, and in those cases, when it's about worshiping God, when it's about obeying God rather than man, that is when you get into this zone where, where I, I believe God approves of that kind of, I don't want to say rebellion, but just choosing to do what God asked. How, what, what is the answer given by the apostle Peter? Why God may have protected these people, Daniel and the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, Shadrach, got thrown into a fiery furnace and yet they came out. They didn't even smell like smoke. Why is that? And God does not promise that. I, I want you to get that clearly in your mind. Just because you are honoring God doesn't mean that you will be protected. Lots of people are, have been um, martyred for, for obeying Christ. But in this case, Peter is before the Sanhedrin, and they're saying, stop preaching Christ. Stop talking about Jesus Christ. Stop saying that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And Peter says these words in Acts 4.19. 
whether it is right in the sight of God. There's where Peter's pinning all his authority. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. <laughs> Man, those are some awesome words of wisdom. Just They just break it down so simply, so quickly, so clearly. It's, it, Peter's going like, it's not really up to me. You be the judge, but you decide whether we should obey you or God. And the Sanhedrin was like, it was all about like, mom, we're God people. We're, we're God free. We uphold the law of God. And so he, Peter just nailed it. If obeying the government's laws means violating God's law, or if a government tries to force you to obey a government in a way that forces you to violate your relationship with God, then you have to believe that you have to choose God over the government. It might be at the price of your life, or your job, or being able to fee, be, be free, or be with your family, and you've seen examples of that before. But those consequences, I want to say, are temporary. They're temporary. Think about the long-term benefits of obeying God rather than man. I want you to know that when Pharaoh or Darius the king or Nebuchadnezzar or the Sanhedrin executed judgment on these people, they were, in, they were within their earthly right. God had put them as king. God had put them as you know, the rulers, the authorities. They were in, within their earthly right to do this. But it doesn't mean that God agreed with their decision. Eventually, they will have to stand before God to give um, account for, um, for their decision. When time has ended... You, Barb, are going to stand and kneel before Christ with President Trump and President Bush and President Clinton, all the presidents. You're going to be right before the Lord with them. <laughs> Every knee is going to bow before the Lord and give account for their life. And I just want to uh, say that the ultimate thing that that I would encourage you to do is when you are making your decisions about what you do, remember that Christ is the ultimate authority. And if you obey God, obey Christ, you won't go wrong. The Lord is sovereign over us. He realizes that we might be in a situation that won't be comfortable. But what God is looking for from us is, were you faithful to me? And I think every one of us, when we appear before the Lord, want the Lord to say, well done, good and faithful servant of my kingdom. Because that indeed is the highest kingdom. And that is the kingdom that the God is sovereign over. The rules of this world are not the same as the rulers of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus pointed that out in, in Matthew 5 when he, he, he laid out, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are, are the things that like, why would you wish that? But God says, no, in my, in my kingdom, this is the way it is. Let's stand and talk about God's wonderful, blessed sovereignty over us. There is strength within the sorrow There's beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting 
sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust oh your plans are still to prosper you've not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood. Oh, Lord, you're faithful forever. Perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are with the money path. Understand your ways, reigning high above the heavens, reaching down in endless praise. You're the lifter of the lowly, compassionate and Kind. You surrounded, you uphold me, and your promises are mighty light. Your plans are still to prosper, you've not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. we go before you help us to say thank you Lord for our government for our officials help us to pray for them faithfully understanding Lord that you're the one that allowed them to be in authority so you have a purpose beyond probably what we can see most likely you have a purpose beyond what we can see help us to 
enjoy the fact that you are sovereign over all nations, our nation, other nations. And when times get really seriously hard, we ask you, God, that you help us to look up to you and, and remember your plans are still to prosper. You have not, you have not forgotten us. You're with us through the fire and you're with us through the flood. Always faithful. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath, yes, Lord, in our love. So we pour out our praise to you. Lord God, we acknowledge that you have given us, you've spoken to us, you've given us the words of life, and you've breathed into our lungs the breath of life, and because that we live, and every morning do you wake us up, Lord God, we're excited because we have the breath of life in our lungs, and with that breath, Lord, we want to praise you, we want to worship you. This morning, that's what we come here to do. Let's stand and worship the Lord. You give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore I don't mean it that way. I mean every that. heart that yeah, like, is broken. Great.
you are 